but uh, usually I fear this bit uh, in a crowd like this, not a crowd, because I always remember what my Afghan teacher used to tell me, that uh, tell us that uh, the stores are that is, you turn your mouth towards your, your ear before you Because it's very difficult to listen to something which is not good enough. Uh, I'm trying to understand myself here, and I'm also trying to understand everybody and our situation. I'm going to pose a question, and if it's possible, you might have to respond or not. The question is, based on the fact that we have been hearing all good intentions, good uh, propositions, and so on and so on about how this, uh, how we can go about doing things in these languages, African languages. Uh, my concern, I won't say in this case, my concern is about language development and empowerment, which of course we facilitate the use of languages, of our languages, in various important political public domains. Now my question is, why are we not seeing much progress in language development and empowerment of indigenous African languages? Uh, I, I think we need to, to think about this question. We don't have to answer it. We think about it and sort of uh, try by all means to respond to that as honestly, passionately, committed as you can. I'm thinking because, I'm, thinking, I'm saying this because I'm, I'm thinking of Africans. Uh, Africans were well, because we say it was developed in 50 years and it became a national language. And so you remember the 14th of August, 1875, when the, what they call, yeah, the Katinos Cup when the Rafael Africans was formed in Nyeba. Mm. And then, why are we not able to develop our languages as expeditiously as possible? Thank you. Um, Michael? <coughs> uh, my comments is to Peter Pladerman. I think uh, we all loved his proposal to translate Neville's biography into several languages, including serialized version of Soxicide, and that's an excellent way of taking Neville forward. So thank you, Peter, for that. Uh, the second one has to do with your very comprehensive chronological uh, account of Neville's you know, various stages of his development. And it's been the most comprehensive account that you've seen. Um, but I think there is an omission at the end when we talk about Neville's involvement in communities through reading clubs. Uh, I think never, at the end, not only stressed community building through reading clubs, but he also expressed a political criticism on the government for failing to uphold the constitutional uh, right to basic education for every child. And wanting, like many people outraged in South Africa, at the failure of the government for early childhood development, never was also outraged and wanted political action on the government. Now the reason why I say this should be included in, in the chronological account is that if it's not included, it would look like Neville, the young Neville on Robben Island, the political revolutionary, <coughs> gradually mellowed into a gracious and brilliant academic towards the end. And he lost all the fight, the political fight. I, I would hate never to be misrepresented as a brilliant academic, uh, but a degenerating uh, political activist. So I would like that to be, uh, you know, set right. What was his political contribution at the end? As part of a growing new movement to challenge the government for failing to uphold the constitutional rights of children. <coughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, Chair. My name is Jolie Asbia. Uh, thanks for the presentation from all of you. I've got two questions. The one for Peter and the one for Aaron. And 
last presentation was uh, very good to me in, 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 in much as it was written in, in after France, but the translation and reflection it was very clear. So I've got no questions for it. Peter, <laughs> 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 your last, your last uh, slide uh, on your language and, 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 and culture tasks, you said there are, there are four tasks that need to be understood by the house. Uh, you spoke about the language planning within the framework and that uh, other <coughs> language is not organized. Uh, uh, to, to a point of uh, harmonization from below. I want to understand, I'm trying to, I'm trying to imagine how to modernize this African language. Uh, <coughs> Alon, you speak about uh, the second theory of transformation, uh, which for me, the current project of transformation is the same way, the manner in which your, your, your conceptualization of second theory is that exactly what the project of transformation is doing? Then how is it that your second theory of transformation <coughs> will do exactly the same thing that the current transformation that we seek to to to, to put forward will do differently? Because I believe that the reason behind it, the transformation <coughs> is the same as your conceptualization of second theory. How is it that it will be different from the current one? I think I'm straightforward. Thanks. <laughs> I hand over to the panel to answer. <laughs> well, I think I will throw it back to you because uh, uh, I think this is, I mean, part of the codification techniques is, is doing a dialogue and, and, and co-inquiring together. And co I mean, I have very, so this is part of the Ferrarian method, codification. So uh, can I throw it back at, at the floor? Um, and I have my own, my own views, but maybe... And I'm very conscious that I'm, I'm, my visa can be can be, can be revoked any second if I'm saying things that are not, and I can be sent to the airport with the, I can be on the next flight. So I'm very conscious of my visa. Thanks, uh, thanks for those questions. Um, <laughs> to, um, I, take, I take Michael's point uh, that um, you know, Neville was <coughs> remained angry in a revolutionary way, uh, right to the end. And you know, working with uh, Paul Hoffman, SC, and others around the constitutional challenge, uh, <coughs> the core challenge to the, the, the rights of the con constitutional rights, rights of the children, I think was, was one way of expressing that. Um, I think Neville made use of the fora that were available uh, throughout the democratic uh, period of South Africa. Um, and when he, without being opportunistic, well, let's say opportunistic <coughs> in, the, in the best sense of the word, in the sense of the principled sense of the word opportunistic, if I can use it that way. I mean, going back to his involvement in the language plan task group, which Minister Ben Gubane of the IFP, uh, pulled together. And Neville played a formative role in that whole process, and it was very much um, within government's uh, ambit of thinking without being of government, and I think that's the crucial point. Mm -hmm. His involvement in the Pan-South African Language Board, similarly, a statutory body uh, created by the Constitution, but not of government, he, made, he remained there for as long as he was able to stay true <coughs> to uh, particular principles, and as you probably recall, he withdrew or retired, or resigned rather, from that mm -hmm. because he felt that there was undue interference uh, from uh, Lionel and Charlie, then Minister of Arts and Culture, um, with regard to the lexicographic units. Um, there's a detail there which we don't need to go into. So, uh, <coughs> and then he played a formative role in the language policy of education, as I said, and not just of basic education, but also of higher education. Um, in other words, he utilized the spaces that were there in a sense, the implementational spaces that were created by a very enabling language policy environment, perhaps uniquely so in post-colonial Africa, certainly. He used that, um, and he was sometimes criticized for it. And, and I think, you know, we need to take that on board. He was criticized by some for his role in PANSOL, and he was criticized <coughs> by others for withdrawing from PANSOL. I think once you put yourself out there in the, in the field of contradictions, you, you, will, um, you will lay yourself open to such criticism. But... 
I think we all agree that uh, up to a point he was fearless, you know, and it, it's his fearlessness to utilize even the courts, which, um, you know, as, as a socialist, he would be extremely skeptical of the role of the judiciary, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. the role of the courts <coughs> in upholding particular class formations. But even there, he used those, and he used people who could use them. So uh, I, I, I salute what you said, uh, Michael. I couldn't uh, agree more. Um, on the point of the sociolinguistics uh, of harmonization, I think the idea that's coming through increasingly from linguistic scholars, sociolinguistic scholars, um, and you, will, you know this better than I, is that there is a sense, a celebration of the heteroglossy and the diversity of African languages, not simply as um, rural dialects, for example, of Isitosa, as in the Eastern Cape, but as urban vernaculars mm -hmm. with their own uh, styling, as, as Brian said, their own dynamics. And uh, scholars are, I was at a recent conference, the Sala LSSA uh, Sal conference in Stellenbosch just this week. Scholars are increasingly pointing to what they call Kasita, the, the language of the location, mm -hmm. as a variety that is, yes, it is used for particular styling purposes, but they're going beyond that and saying, these kinds of non-formal, non-standard varieties, and we would say in traditional Java, these non-standard varieties need to be incorporated mm -hmm. into schooling in any way, in, in a way that uh, in a more stable diagnostic situation mm -hmm. in Europe, for example, uh, non-standard varieties of German, the dialects, have been built or have been used as bridges into the standard variety in Switzerland, for example, or in Germany. Uh, and, and of course, the, the debate around CARPs is particularly uh, vital in that regard. Maybe my name wants to say something about that because they have recently been called by by uh, people uh, to say CARPs should be used as a variety in its own right in the classroom. Now, the question that arises, of course, is literacy. It's all very well to speak of spoken dialects and varieties, but what do you do um, to generate uh, uh, written products? And I think that's perhaps <coughs> where we can have an interesting debate. Uh, just on the harmonization issue, um, I think languages develop through use. Uh, you know, we recognize that they don't fall from the sky. So you can't plan corpus ahead of status. Uh, you can't kind of plan top down for users of a language and then hope that they will use it. That's not how it works. That's part of the, the, the answer, but clearly the harmonization from below means recognizing the diversity of practices and bringing those into the classroom. <coughs> Just to give one example, um, at a conference, at the same conference recently, uh, Felix Banda of the University of the Western Cape cited some research in a Cape Flats classroom in, uh, in Delft, um, which um, showed the absurdity of distinguishing between Afrikaans and English-speaking children. He had in the same classroom, he said, uh, children who were supposedly mother tongue speakers of Afrikaans and mother tongue speakers of English. The teacher... Uh, tried by all means possible to have a what we call a language separation approach in within a dual medium situation, meaning that the Afrikaans speakers were put in one side of the classroom and the English speakers supposedly on the other. Then this teacher would heroically uh, say something in Afrikaans and then go and translate it into English. Half the children or more of the children for whom it was intended had already understood it <laughs> and vice versa. So he was making the point uh, we should do away with the idea on the Cape Flats context of dual medium Afrikaans English uh, classes because there is a mixed code and there's a, there's a kind of translanguaging, and this is the new concept, that keeps coming in, which in a sense transcends these, these neatly bounded units that we like to divide um, learners into. So w when we say harmonization from below, it is simply taking the idea of people's spoken... Um, Varieties and saying, how can we institutionalize them without robbing them of their vitality? You see, and this is what the schooling system, unfortunately, is so good at doing. It robs us of our vitality. Uh, and so ways will need to be found. Never would, would be the first to acknowledge that you can't do this um, without considering the wider economy, the political economy. In other words, people must want to do it. You can't simply prescribe and say, we will do it. I think KwaZulu-Natal offers a, a really salutary example with no fewer than three, I think, daily newspapers, Isolezwe being the first, which use Isizulu as, as the language um, of, of the newspaper. And if you can create a media environment which is inevitably coupled to uh, an economy 
you can create the demand, you can create the incentives for people to want to use those languages. And if people want to use those <coughs> languages, they will contribute their varieties to those languages. So, so in this sense, that's the from below part. The part I haven't spoken about is the, <coughs> is the rather sad story of the, the above part, from above. The Pan-South African Language Board has, uh, to all intents and purposes, failed in that, that particular function. Uh, Neville has been you know, very vocal in its criticism. If there are representatives of Pants, I would like to create, co correct that impression. I'd be very, very willing to hear from them. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Um, if, if so, then uh, we'll continue until quarter past 11 and then have 15 minutes tea. <laughs> I was not intending to say anything today, but I'm worried about the gentleman at the top there. Uh, I will try to be of assistance. As a former advisor in governance, I think we've got structures in high places. But our ignorance is killing our nation and our children. I'm worried because I'm a feminist. I've got children and I've got grandchildren. I've been an advisor in the executive mayor for many years, for children in particular. And I've been in the premier's office mm -hmm. in the family portfolio head for family divorces. Mm -hmm. What worries me is we are a nation lost in transformation as far as a uh, subjective branch or an advocate. You'll mm -hmm. find that educators in our school are sending their children in town models. And you'll notice our government is not, comp is not, is not, is not willing to, to lift up our education standard as we want to for years that it was better education. And you are my witness today, it's worse. Uh, article number four of the UNRC <coughs> is compelling us to create a conducive environment for children to grow. Chapter two, section 10 of our Bill of Rights says, we have inherited a right that our dignity must be respected and shall be protected. And if the reason why I'm saying this is because I do not believe I'll be doing justice that Neville dedicated his life to do. And if there is no political will, politicians, to make sure that we are bridging the gap between the heaven of knots. And I want to say across Caroline, across all ideology, we are doing nothing. We are all fed up. And for the sake of our children, I'm appealing to all of us. Let's do something. Let's take those politicians <coughs> to account. Because we're clapping hands. You know, let them do what they do. And I've asked a question, and I know that I'm always out of order. <laughs> Yesterday I asked a question. Can we trust the current leadership of the ANC when the president is taking our money in his own house, which show no remorse? We cannot. We must be concerned of our children. And our children are in tatters. I've been the chairperson for children for seven years. The digitalized for children. I've seen them being abused by foreigners. We call them foreigners. Nigerian. <laughs> Take our children for a ride. What are we doing? We're smiling because your child is safe. What about the next door neighbor? They're not safe. I've been in court here 2008 where neighbors are stealing from each other. So you know what was that reason? Because we are buying food and pick and pay. And we are throwing that bread whilst people are still living in Atsa. At least I just want to appeal to all of us. Let us be calm again. Be human enough. And if I was going to go biblically, I was going to refer you to Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1, verses 20, that says, All things are permitted, but not all of them are good, neither building us. We are a totally nation that is lost in trust. We are going to go and vote again next year. And we are all voting for the wrong people. I'm ready for coming, but please, let's across Caroline, across all ideologies, stand up for our children's rights. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Look, uh, I want to talk a bit about um, language as a tool of struggle. Um, <coughs> uh, Comrade Ryan from Madeira, uh, who you know, translated the, 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 the Communist Manifesto into his CISO, right? And uh, I think what we need to look at is, is uh, how, how do we ensure that. Uh, we, we use that to, uh, uh, you know, communist man, man, 
manifesto, which is in this, this is as you know, part of our our, our popular edu edu education programs in our, in our communities. I, I, I think for me that can you know, begin to um, play an important no role in the, you know, strengthening our our languages, but <coughs> also using uh, you know uh, languages as a, a tool of you know, struggle. And uh, I think also we've, we've seen a number of you know, struggles and also a, a number of you know the protests farm workers in Marikana, and uh, a lot of work has been written by academics who have been you know, participated in those struggles. I'm not, I'm not saying academics mustn't write about, about, about those issues. I'm, uh, I'm not you know, trying to be territorial. But all, 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 all I'm saying is that we, we need to begin to look at how do we ensure that um, workers who are uh, who are participants in those, in those struggles are also able to write their stories in, the, in their own languages. And, they, and, they, and, they, and then from there, we may look at you know, the, uh, um, translations you know, so that other workers and, and, and other participants of, 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 of other struggles can also learn from as had as struggles in that, in that way we are, we are using mm -hmm. language as a tool of, of, of struggle I think that is uh, who, what you, you know comrade uh, never wanted to, to, to see you know, so that, you know, language doesn't just become an, an academic exercise but but then it, it, it becomes part and parcel of, of um, linking our, our our struggles and also our our, our, our campaigns, and then I think that another sad you know, you know story is that in our in our unions now there is an em emphasis on you know, use of English. Even you know, union <laughs> documents are, are not you know translated, and and, and yet we, we, we know that um, uh, you know a, 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 a number of workers are not you know, conversant in, 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 in English. So I think those are some, are some of the things we, we, we need to think about, yeah. Then I'll take the last um, question. Um, yeah, okay. Um, Peter, you spoke about um, the harmonization of languages, which is, is a very interesting um, concept and, I mean, uh, uh, I followed it from different uh, views and uh, I'm impressed, though <coughs> I feel like it's more of step three and we, we are on step one, we need step two. What I mean is, um, and it's going to echo what a gentleman um, has asked, I think we we forgot his question to say um, why are we not seeing pro uh, progress in the development of African languages? When are we going to see uh, marginalized languages such as Chivenda, Shitonga being on the level of the likes of Africans? And there are many issues. I mean, um, we still struggle to have a complete bilingual dictionary in some of these languages. And in the likes of Africans, we have a monolingual dictionary, which is like, you know, a big, big one. So how do we close that gap? How do we take this that we call official languages <coughs> and get them to the same level, even if it can't be the same, but just close the gap first before we go to the step three of experimenting other things, you know? Um, and and it, it, it is a deep issue because there are many factors that help languages such as Africans, English, 
in this country to develop. I'm a writer. <laughs> I got three books in, in Sepedi. And I will tell you that literature in indigenous languages or African languages is still controlled or caged by school prescription uh, screening uh, criteria. <clears throat> because if you write a novel which is 300 pages, no publisher will publish it. You have to write a novella because that is what the, mm, the, 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 the school prescription uh, regard as a novel in those languages. And will literature in those languages develop? There, there are many factors which contribute to the continuous killing of these languages. And we are not addressing them. We are looking at step three of it. I'm not saying step three is irrelevant, but can't we address this kind of question? A gentleman is asking there, why are we not seeing progress in the development of African languages? Thank you. We have a few minutes, so I'll, uh, I'll urge each uh, panelist to take it this um, one minute to answer the question. In terms of the development of the African languages, I always find myself in a difficult position when I start talking about it because I just become so extremely um, upset, put it that way. The reason being that you've referred to, for instance, this big Afrikaans dictionary that we're talking about, Ivia Arti, and that of course is one of the South African, one of the 11 national lexicographic projects. And it's been going on and it's been funded by state for a very, very long time. And now, as all the other lexicographic units, it falls under the auspices of, Pan of the Pan-South African Language Board. And one of the reasons why those dictionaries are not being developed is simply because the funding that they're getting from pan Salap is just not enough. And pan Salap is saying that they're getting the funding from the Department of Arts and Culture, and one of the big sort of um, thrusts that we have at the moment is an attempt to get it away from arts and culture and to get the lexicographic units under the Department of Education, because we have a feeling that if we could work with the Department of Education, we might be able to get more funding for the various lexicographic units. So I think one of the issues that I really have, or one of my responses would be, is that from a top-down situation, the Pan-South African Language Board that is supposed to be the watchdog, that's supposed to work with terminology, development, etc., are simply just not coming to the party. That's the one side of it. The other thing that I think that is also very important is you also need, um, I think, for any language to really get that terminology development is you need a lot of support from the speakers of that particular language. And I think that is maybe something that when I listen to you and I hear what you say in terms of Sepedi and the books being prescribed and it's sort of really being clustered for a particular market and it makes it very difficult to break out of that. I think the speakers of a language also need to start standing up for it. And that very often you find in South Africa, in my perspective, and I'm being very, very um, aware of the fact that this is very, um, uh, what is the, a, a one-sided perspective, is I often get the idea that people of the various indigenous languages are not really prepared to stand up for those languages because of what we've heard earlier today in the sense that English is the chosen language because it stands for social mobility and social mobili mobility is what people want for their children. So somehow to change that perception to say what we need is social mobility, we need it via our languages and therefore we need to back up our languages to give that to our children. So I think the answer in my mind lies is a twofold one. On the one hand you need a lot of support from the speakers of the particular languages. On the other hand, you also need sort of those institutions who are supposed to develop the particular terminologies to be funded properly in order to do so. My perspective. I think it's an open question uh, to us. Um, I certainly don't have the answers. Um, what may be a sign of hope is uh, to, to go against, um, how shall I put it, Usually, the schooling system lags behind the formal economy, right? Schools, uh, the relationship between schooling and economy is, is quite a complex one, but usually 
the, the economy determines what will be taught in schools. What is regarded as important is, is solidified in the form of the curriculum, and that, uh, that goes for languages too. But perhaps we need to look at uh, the, the um, education sector, and I include um, literary production in the, in the broad sense of education, the cultural sector, as a potential driver of, of the economy. In other words, to reverse that role. Uh, I don't have really time to go into that in detail, but uh, my sense is that if, for example, the proposal that all children should learn an African language, which is due to start from next year for grade R all the way through to schooling, if that becomes a reality and there's a, there's a market that's been created for African languages within the schooling sector, that will have spin-off effects beyond the schooling sector. In other words, it will impact on the cultural production of indigenous languages. And it is quite possible that over the next five to ten years, there will be a, as it were, an organic um, incentive to produce and buy novels in Chivenda, Chitsonga, and other more marginalized South African languages. But it's really an open I, question. I'd just, um, just like to formulate the question to pick up on what you just said. Uh, if they do not stand for their own languages, then what could we do? I mean, if, if they do you not... Know, they could not stand, stand for their own language, then what is our role as the people who are, who are just trying to help them? I'm very careful sort of to work with that idea. I'm sorry, I have to cut this okay. session very short. Um, thank you very much.